and forth maintenance. Getting quite trippy on the tongue there. Um, it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce Dame Tessa Jow. Dame Tessa is no stranger to the Mile End Group. You made quite an entrance to the Alistair Campbell night, I seem to remember, um, and was also here for our 100th meeting with Tony Blair. Dame Tessa Jow has been Member of Parliament for Dulwich and West Norwood since 1992. A member of both Tony Blair and Gordon Brown's cabinets, Dame Tessa was Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport between 01 and 07. In 2004, she launched and in 2005 presided over London's successful bid, East London's successful bid, to host <laughs> the 2012 Olympic Games. For all these things and more, Tony Blair described Dame Tessa as having a rare integrity rarely seen in politics. As founder of the 1998 Sure Start scheme, which aimed to give children the best possible start in life by improving childcare, early education, health and family support, Dame Tessa is uniquely placed to comment on its challenge to the conventional machinery of government. Ladies and gentlemen, Dame Tessa Jow. John, thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed. And thank you all for coming to hear me this evening instead of all the other competing attractions that you might have, you might have succumbed to. I'm absolutely delighted to have this um, opportunity to, uh, to talk uh, about Sure Start and to contribute my experience of uh, creating uh, Sure Start to your, what I hope is your understanding of uh, some of the, the more uh, prosaic issues of the, um, the machinery of government, how government works and uh, how government can work better. Now, uh, let me just talk about uh, the beginning because uh, Sure Start came about um, in opposition uh, through my friendship with David Blunkett, and never underestimate uh, friendship as a very good and constructive basis for the development of good policy. And David and I were both uh, rather sort of enraptured by an organisation called Home Start. Um, Home Start, which uh, has a small army of volunteers across the country who basically help new parents cope with being new parents. I also had two young children, and I always feel that I want to dedicate Sure Start to my health visitor, somebody called Kira Hayden, who had served new families in Kentish Town for some 40 years with sensitivity, professionalism, and commitment. Uh, that uh, defined the humanity of the best of our public services. So there you are, those are two, those are twin uh, motivators for the foundation of uh, Sure Start. Let me um, just say a little bit about um, Home Start, um, because Home Start was mothers supporting mothers, fathers supporting, father, uh, uh, supporting new mothers, new, new, new parents. And I always remember um, an, an example that was, was given to me of um, a, a, a new mother who just had, uh, she had a two and a half year old, and she just had twins, a challenge by any standard. And I remember the Home Start uh, volunteer who was uh, local to my constituency saying, um, describing how they went into her family to help her cope uh, with the shopping and the demands of another two babies. And they said, uh, but the difference is we don't do the shopping, we just help her cope with a double buggy and a toddler in the supermarket. So you get the point, it's a different kind of um, set of aptitudes and, uh, and uh, the ability to cope. And one of the features of the early Sure Start 
concept that I loved as an optimist is that it believed in the best of human nature, that every mother wants to be the best mother that she can to her new, child, her, to her new baby. And uh, that ambition of the earliest childhood is often not uh, borne out as she grows up in her relationship uh, with her children. So, and then I think the third um, so f foundation and motivating uh, point um, beyond this, um, the need for practical support that enables you to, to cope, beyond um, you know this uh, you know whole you know this th th this this whole idea about the importance of early um, confidence is that the great divide comes within the first thousand days. We know much more about that now than we did at the time that Sure Start was designed. And what I mean by that is that the neuroscientific research and the early uh, the research um, evidence that supports the very early psychological and uh, physical development of new babies basically uh, underlines beyond any doubt the importance of that period from conception to when um, a, a child is two and a half, uh, three years old. And I sort of knew that intuitively because I had, before I became a member of parliament, I'd um, actually done a lot of clinical training, um, psychotherapeutic uh, training with families, with very damaged children. And I often used to wonder um, what it was that distinguished the behavior at seven of two children who seem to have had equally disrupted uh, deprived, um, un, uh, 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 unfulfilling early childhoods. And, you know, one would be coping at school, be able to sit in the classroom from you know, the beginning of a lesson to the end. And the other would be the child that those of you who were teachers um, would recognize, who was constantly disruptive, attention-seeking, um, needy. And as I looked back over the detailed case notes of these two contrasting stories, the child who was coping, who might be in the third or fourth foster home, was distinguished from the child who wasn't, even at seven, because there had always been somebody in the coping child's life who had loved them enough for long enough to instill in them a sense of their own value. And this is what uh, Donald Winnicott, a uh, child psychoanalyst whose work influenced me a lot, um, used to call the Ark of Rapture. You know, you see, there's, there's a picture of um, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge holding little baby George. Um, just, just uh, it was one of the first official pictures. But you can see this little baby looking at his mother, smiling at his mother, who is smiling at him. And this is what Winnicott meant. Um, it's a very public example of this arc of rapture, which is so affirming in the early consciousness of babies. Now, all this sounds a very long way, I suspect, from the public policy uh, that uh, you're here to hear about. But that was <coughs> the conundrum of Sure Start. How do you translate the intimacy of early childhood into um, a system for service delivery that gives expression to this policy and becomes, and it's not an overstatement to say this, becomes the hard wiring of the engine that drives greater equality. Because 
If I also tell you that the early evaluation of Sure Start revealed, uh, revealed um, uh, a, a, a discrepancy in the, um, the number of words that a child from a middle class uh, of middle class parents who was talked to, read to, sung to, um, and the uh, child of a mother who had never been sung to or read to herself, so didn't understand the importance of this um, for her own baby. You know, it was um, you know a, f a factor of twenty fold and rising, and it becomes at three an almost unbridgeable gap. Hence the importance of understanding um, this, uh, the, the, the evidence that defines this uh, first thousand days. So, as I say, that I hope gives you a flavour of where this, uh, where with this idea came from. And then you link to that um, uh, Gordon Brown's invitation to me as a, as a new minister, relatively new member of parliament, to chair a cross-departmental group um, that would uh, assess the quality of services for very, very small children, children under three, and make recommendations. And so I had an advisory group uh, that very quickly behaved in the way of advisory groups, cross-government, um, and just nodded and uh, engaged at the, unfortunately, uh, the fairly minimal degree that was necessary. David Blunkett and I were powering ahead um, with this um, idea. And we had a team in the Treasury who became passionate in pursuit of their greater understanding of early childhood. And uh, so already you can see the profound challenge this represented to traditional culture, uh, departmental culture, uh, traditional ministerial uh, responsibility and the scale of ambition when um, I describe to you Sure Start as the hard wiring of uh, the government's uh, fight against uh, predetermined inequality, inequality set in very early, um, in very early childhood. So the intimacy of enabling more mothers to become their baby's first teacher, supported on a voluntary basis by other community mothers, was what the machinery of government had to capture and give uh, effect to. And uh, to begin with, it was absolutely, um, it was absolutely fine. And uh, the review uh, ran its course. Uh, the conclusions were adopted. A very large amount of money, 452 million pounds, uh, was committed. And Sure Start was launched, um, as was the uh, way of new labor, with a series of, we didn't call them pilots, we called them trailblazers, because uh, and that's an important distinction. They were trailblazers because we knew nobody was going to tell me that this wasn't going to make a difference to the lives of babies. <laughs> so we weren't having pilots to persuade us that what we were setting out to prove uh, might have something in it. It was uh, the, the steady building of the presence of these services for very young children. Um, initially in um, boroughs, neighbourhoods, uh, that really wanted them and had the necessary infrastructure uh, to make them um, a success. And in those very early days, so the evidence base for Sure Start lay in the material that was available at the time. Uh, particularly uh, the literature about early successful, healthy, early childhood development. But of course, there were also the examples um, that came from um, America, High Scope, um, ABC Darien, um, the um, other programs that um, the Americans had launched with 
a degree of success, <coughs> but again, the characteristic of these programs was that they were long-term. And uh, in some cases, uh, over, ran over um, 30 years um, in order to, um, to, to prove uh, their worth. Now, the early uh, trailblazers, um, which were located all around the country, were different in London. And uh, you may uh, remember, so four, f three or four years ago, a bit of controversy about whether uh, Sure Start should be providing baby massage for the middle classes. Um, and you know these were articles written in the Observer, and usually at the weekends. And I have to tell you, they were written by journalists who didn't get out much, because <laughs> this um, highly desirable social mix was pretty exclusive to London, and pretty exclusive to London because it is in London that gentrification has created um, the, uh, the the mixed communities that we uh, that we love living in. In other parts of the country, you know, like Leeds, like Birmingham, like Liverpool, like Manchester, like Sandwell, um, you don't get that same degree of inner city uh, gentrification and therefore social mix. And uh, it took me a little while to realize this, and I greatly celebrated the idea that uh, we were in practice demonstrating what Richard Titmus always warned against which is that services only for the poor are poor services. And Sure Start was power driving um, through that uh, iniquity. But it was in London. And outside London, uh, the nature of the programmes uh, tended to be different um, from those that were shaped by this combination of heavily involved um, middle class and largely um, educated mum, mums and their uh, poorer and invariably less, com uh, le le less confident um, uh, fellow, um, fellow users. But Sure Start also was underpinned by that rather wonderful observation of, um, or, or a sort of crystallization of the ambition of motherhood by Donald Winnicott, to whom I've already um, referred when uh, you know when you have a new baby you you can get caught in the kind of tyranny of perfection motherhood as perfection and Donald Winnicott developed this idea of the good enough mother and uh, go to any school playground in my constituency and you'll see it populated by good enough mothers you know who are bonded to their children who understand instinctively um, their children's needs, but don't sometimes get very cross and don't sometimes put them to bed without uh, reading to them or may quite often not read to them. But the bonds um, between those children and their mothers are strong enough to provide the necessary resilience for the healthy development of those children. Now, let me talk about the structure of Sure Start, and because the focus of this lecture is um, essentially on the challenge that it posed to the machinery of government. And the challenge it posed, you know, was actually a profound one. Um, because, first of all, governments will instinctively deliver successful policy. Um, within the, uh, the, the silos of individual <coughs> departments. And um, uh, a, an initiative, a policy, which is focused on early childhood, by its very formulation, presents um, a great challenge. Uh, and largely because of the long-standing friendship that David Blunkett and I had, and it was that, when David, when we both went into government and were as passionate about getting the successor to Homestart um, launched, uh, David was Secretary of State for Education and Skills and I was the Minister for Public Health in the um, Department of Health. 
And so we slightly retrofitted, and it's important um, to be honest about this, we slightly retrofitted the justification that this should be run on a cross-departmental basis um, because uh, by arguing that, it meant we could do it together. And we were very keen to do it together. But one of the things that it's important never to underestimate in government, in looking at how policy becomes successful and looking beyond structure, is that if you have ministers who like working together, who are sort of empowered by shared passion, you're likely to get some pretty good and innovative policy. Similarly, the great mistake is to separate a minister from a policy they love. And I loved Sure Start. And I was very cross that uh, when I was promoted and became employment minister, I couldn't go on being the minister for Sure Start. But at the time, I think that Tony felt that it was one battle too many um, with the Chancellor of the Exchequer. So uh, again, there you are. The, these are the kinds of uh, decisions which are taken for um You know, for, for reasons of what's prevailing at that moment, although that went on for rather a long time. <laughs> um, so uh, the first is the relationship between ministers. The second is the investment that ministers have in uh, policies that they have created. And incidentally, um, I, I did manage to stick with the Olympics for 10 years, and um, I'd learned how you... <laughs> <laughs> how you hold on and remain uh, connected to a policy that you have a huge investment in. And I, uh, you know, again, don't underestimate that as a prescription for successful policy making. And the third thing is, um, is to recognize that these kinds of policies take time and be realistic in setting the expectation for the delivery of results. And probably the results of Sure Start, um, as it was originally conceived, would not really have been realized for about 10 years. But uh, those children we saw running around the streets of London uh, during the riots with no sense of right or wrong and no sense of boundary might have been different had the nurture ethos of Sure Start been persisted with and uh, been more <coughs> central. So uh, there you are. Those are four, um, four uh, uh, what I've learned to be characteristics of, um, of good policy making. Um, I suppose the great uh, tribute to Sure Start's success is that um, at the time of the last election, there was a a race between the leaders of the three main parties to love Sure Start more and to pledge more support for Sure Start and more guarantees that uh, children's centres that became the, um, the, the physical home of Sure Start programmes uh, would not uh, be closed. And I think it's fair to say that uh, Sure Start is now um, one of the um, I mean, it's, it's just simply a fact of life. It is a policy which is a national treasure. And uh, you wouldn't stand, you wouldn't enhance your chances of election if you stood on a platform of rationalizing, um, reducing, uh, making, or making a sure start more um, efficient. I have to tell you, though, that in the first two or three years of Sure Start, it was almost impossible to get anybody to be interested. And um, I often used to think in a new Labour way how wonderful it would be to have a major um, launch of the trailblazers for Sure Start. And uh, we had them all over the country and National Sure Start Day and so forth. And it was always very low key. And in retrospect, I think it was more secure uh, because of that, because um, healthy childhood doesn't exactly um, attract the headlines, does it? The exception 
too healthy childhood, like a baby pee, um, will tragically dominate the headlines for days on end. But the quiet uh, development of children into f uh, babies, into functioning children and uh, competent uh, teenagers is not something um, of, uh, is not something of headlines. So it was a challenge to the machinery of government. Um, it was born of the special commitment of uh, the, the, the founding ministers. And it very quickly sort of became institutionalized once we were on to the kind of second wave of what were called trailblazers, as Sure Start was rolled out around the country. But then, round about 2003, um, something really, uh, I mean, something counterintuitive happened with Sure Start. And I remember having this discussion with Gordon when the, the, the focus of government policy shifted from whether or not uh, Sure Start uh, was delivering as a nurture programme uh, uh, to a focus on work being the best route out of poverty. So what happened from then on was that rather than Sure Start being a programme, uh, a service, a community um, initiative that bonded mothers together, it became a programme that looked after children so their mothers could go to work. And I think that was a profound mistake. And uh, it's something which I hope that Sure Start, uh, th that the essence of Sure Start can be recovered in the context, the important context, of mothers um, having, being able to use good enough childcare um, in order that they, uh, particularly single mums, um, in order uh, that they can uh, that they can go to work, hold down jobs, um, because there are two things in this. Um, one is the importance of children not growing up in households which are intergenerationally workless, um, but also children growing up in households that feel that they have a sense of family. Um, where family is sort of celebrated in all the ways that I suspect most of us would uh, take for granted. So I think that uh, certainly nurture is going on in a number of uh, the children's centres around uh, the country, but it is not the universal and defining characteristic of Sure Start. The defining characteristic of Sure Start is probably childcare, and then uh, in it, it flowing on from childcare um, is probably early education. But that misses, and that does create a vulnerability in this first thousand days, and uh, the uh, those vital months, um, uh, you know, until um, a, a, a child uh, becomes. Three. Now, the evaluation of Sure Start shows the um, the great excitement uh, of the civil service at this new way of working, and it's worth sort of just reflecting. Um, it's worth just reflecting on that and uh, saying a little bit more about the challenge that the essence of Sure Start, which I hope I've managed to convey to you that uh, Sure Start created uh, to the machinery of government. And um, you'll all know that uh, it was John Maynard Keynes who observed that government <coughs> machinery has been described as a marvelous labor-saving device which enables 10 men to do the work of one. And the protection of Sure Start from bureaucracy was something very important and therefore I suppose um, when Naomi Eisenstadt um, observed in, um, 
a policy reunion debate at the Institute for Government, which she and I did recently. She observed the excitement that civil servants felt that I, as Minister for Public Health, was answering questions about Sure Start at education uh, departmental questions. You, you want to say, well, surely there's more to it than that. That may be um, a breakthrough in terms of the, the literal um, machinery of government and uh, convention, but actually the achievements of Sure Start through this collaboration are probably um, a more important and um, a more exciting um, challenge. Um, but Sure Start did become um, a magnet for the involvement of other departments, and particularly at the point where uh, the, uh, the focus ceased to be solely on nurture and uh, moved to this new focus on um, welfare to work, work as the best route out of poverty, getting mothers um, out to work and their children um, well cared for in children's centres. So then you had a kind of three-way um, engagement of the Department of Health, Work and Pensions, and the, um, the Department for um, Education. Um, and then, of course, um, you get the tremendous problems um, of interdepartmental rivalry compounded when you have local authorities being the hosts and the providers of children's centres. And it all focuses on reward. And as one of the Sure Start um, evaluations observed, um, the problem is that if the fruit of our labour doesn't fall in our garden, if a local authority spends money on getting somebody back to work, but their return to work, the mother's return to work, becomes a big tick in uh, the, uh, on the report card for DWP, the incentives for local authorities to engage in the s with the spirit of the program is greatly diminished. So what is important there is if you're going to reconstruct the delivery machinery of government nationally and locally, you have to ensure that the incentives are in the right place and not that the incentives encourage the behaviours that uh, you're seeking to change. And that really is one of the, um, one of the biggest challenges and why um, what I've often argued as the four stages of policy making ending with the importance of auditing unexpected success uh, perverse effects and um, unintended failure is so important so that you have this kind of dynamic reassessment of the means of delivery and align the means of delivery uh, with, the, um, the initial, um, with the initial objectives. I think also that in addition to the, uh, the peril of um, perverse, uh, perverse effects that come about through sort of complex delivery is also the reluctance of the civil service culturally um, to reach a brutal conclusion one way or the other. And so the other risk is that you reach what Naomi Eisenstadt described as an amiable solution um, with uh, quite a lot of what would be described as constructive ambiguity. And that doesn't give you a clean or clear enough basis for locating accountability and measuring uh, the contribution of, the, uh, of each of the, the component um, departments. The next point that I wanted to make, and this is a broader point about contemporary policy, and this is something that I'm absolutely uh, persuaded of, is that Sure Start as a programme of investment in early childhood 
is by definition a programme whose results will not be seen for more than one parliament. And this brings us to uh, the challenge which is frequently um, brought out and examined of how you create that long-term policy stability so that uh, results are um, achieved rather than you know, this constant uprooting of fledgling ideas which never, um, which never reach maturity. And certainly the successful American um, examples uh, did have that long-term uh, commitment, I think largely because they were free of um, the kind of you know, federal uh, roller coaster of uh, four yearly um, elections. And I think that that is in these areas, um, and let's take early childhood as one of the biggest challenges that face us, uh, a challenge where we're fortified by good research, a challenge where we're fortified by the evidence of the costs of failure. And we have to build the platform for consensus, political consensus and public support, but political consensus, which is underpinned by a uh, sustainable long-term uh, delivery uh, capability in the machinery of government. And that really is, I mean, it sounds uh, rather pathetic to say it, but it is charting new territory. But we will not, uh, we will not see uh, a substantial inroad in the sort of inequality that begins, uh, that, that, that becomes manifest by uh, the time a child's four or five, unless we succeed in doing this. And unless the commitment to intervention is sustained, the ethos is consistent, and uh, the financial base is secure enough for the local services to plan for the at least for the medium term. So that's there's the next uh, the next challenge to um, to, uh, to to government. So. The challenge of Sure Start was that it defied, because of its innovative nature, it sort of defied um, easy classification and it defied um, the uh, sort of conventional um, policy, uh, policy portfolio. But it is this point that um, research uh, by the Wave Trust has found uh, and, and on good estimate has, has judged that programmes like Sure Start, when well designed, return benefits from over 75% to as much as 1,000% uh, higher than costs. It's a, an extraordinary um, rate of return and higher than the rate of return um, obtained from other um, public and private investments. And um, the Wave Trust provides quite an interesting um, uh, comparison with Sweden, which adopted a whole country approach to uh, uh, prevention in uh, early years. They call it early years prevention, which is not quite what it means, but setting up this resilience in small children um, in early, early childhood. And uh, the, uh, the Wave Trust uh, con research concluded that uh, Sweden showed um, infant mortality at a rate half of that in the UK, obesity levels half of those in the UK, teenage pregnancy a quarter of the level in the UK, and then deaths from premature deaths from other uh, preventable conditions like cancer and smoking related diseases, circulatory diseases, um, at 25% uh, uh, lower than uh, the population as, um, as a whole. But to return to the uh, domestic evaluation, let me just share with you some of the, um, the specific conclusions from Sure Start uh, 10 years on that were um, published by Birkbeck University that um, undertook 
uh, the evaluation. And I always used to get very cross when the evaluators levelled any criticism at all at this perfect being that was your start. So I, mean, I had to be factored out, I think, in my own mind um, of, of, of that calculation. But they did find that in um, that Sure Start local programs uh, showed that mothers across those populations, those Sure Start population areas, rather than those mothers who were not in Sure Start uh, local areas, engaged in discipline that was less less harsh of their children, um, and uh, that these were mothers, particularly mothers that created a more stimulated, st stimulating environment for learning their children at home. And uh, you'll all have noted the, um, one of the really powerful recent indicators that was reported about the positive effect of fathers reading to their children um, in, uh, in very early childhood. Mothers also, from the research, also reported um, that their home environment was less chaotic for their boys, strangely not so for their girls, and that they just, um, where they were single mums, that they just felt more satisfied with their lives, and they felt that they were coping better with the, respons the dual responsibility of being at work and, um, and being mothers. So these are, um, these are very specific uh, uh, but observed and rigorous uh, conclusions that I think um, speak well to uh, the bigger studies and the studies uh, conducted over a, um, a longer period. So let me uh, just uh, conclude with uh, the important lessons both for government and also um, programs for early childhood. And this is really to recap. Um, if we take um, the lessons for government um, from Sure Start, the first is that good relationships between ministers build uh, better policy and more sustainable policies. Um, the second is the damage done by moving ministers um, too often, particularly where ministers have um, an established investment in the policy uh, that is being uh, developed. And this is even more important in circumstances where um, collaborative relationships across departments have been established. Um, and the third, um, I mean, there are sort of two points in that, but the third is um, that policy purpose should define into departmental uh, relationships rather than the other way around. And sometimes interdepartmental working of its own sake um, is seen as a triumph. But actually, the triumph has to be judged by the, uh, the better policy and the better results for uh, the public um, that, res that um, arise from that. And finally, finally, on what I think um, the, sure s the experience of Sure Start um, tells us about uh, the best quality of, um, uh, of childcare uh, and, and what it actually means. And we all know how childcare has sort of risen up the, um, the public agenda. Um, we know that in London, the costs of, you know, one in three uh, of every pound that um, a mother takes home in London, a family takes home in London, uh, is likely to be spent on childcare. The costs of childcare are rising faster than anywhere else in the country. But the fact is that often parents are paying for childcare of, uh, in a, of poor quality um, that is not sufficiently flexible um, to meet their needs. So um, the number one point um, for good, uh, good policy, good services, focus on early bonding and building attachments between mothers and their babies in the early weeks, the early months, and obviously the early 
years. And um, I know that um, Naomi Eisenstadt has some concern about um, policy offers that suit the working life of mothers, but may mean that their children um, are away from them for very long periods. And I think that uh, we really have to be guided by policy, not ideology, in uh, this area. If we want to be confident that the investment being made is um, the best for very tiny children. The second is the importance of staff which are who are well trained and understand um, and can apply in their practice the importance of this evidence, understand the importance of early attachments, of uh, stable, loving um, relationships, can see the warning signs when children um, begin to express their distress uh, or insecurity through um, <coughs> disruptive behavior and have the means uh, to intervene and deal with that. The third point is much greater flexibility um, in provision. And uh, this is something which uh, tends to have impact on some of the poorest mothers who in London, uh, other big cities may be doing two or three jobs in order to um, in earn, earn enough money to keep uh, the family going. And uh, this really addresses this, the importance of flexibility is a big challenge and addresses uh, the fact of life for many very little children that they're woken up two hours before they, they are ready to wake up um, in order to be taken to their first childminder so that their mother can go to work um, and do her first job of what may be three jobs in the day, cleaning our offices, doing the things that we rely on uh, for our working lives to be more comfortable. And I really think um, that that's a challenge that we've got to interrogate and find better solutions to that children don't bear um, the price in discomfort and disruption for. And then the fourth is um, the development of mother's skills so that they are, and father's skills, but so that uh, they really are their children's uh, first teacher. And I'll just finish with two things. Um, I visited um, <coughs> last week um, a nursery in Croydon, which has, as part of it, um, classrooms for mothers to do their GCSEs in, or NVQs, but in uh, English, uh, maths, uh, childcare. And it was very touching listening to one of a group of mothers, and all the other mothers were nodding their heads when, when she talked, about what it had meant to her, um, having been barely literate when she, first, she had her first baby and really didn't have enough literacy uh, to read, uh, to feel that she couldn't reveal her literacy to her second baby. But her fourth daughter, her proudest moment was being able to read her a bedtime story when she was a year or 18 months old. Because uh, while her children were in nursery, they, uh, she had been able to do her English GCSE. And the nursery regime was sufficiently flexible to enable her to do that. And finally, um, in my story that I've shared with you this evening about Sure Start, there are all sorts of ways of measuring success. And I've tried to set out uh, some of you, uh, some of them for you this evening in a systematic way. But Naomi Eisenstadt, when, uh, who was the director of Sure Start that I appointed uh, when the program went live, reminded me that uh, when she asked me what I thought success for Sure Start would be, I apparently said to her, Naomi, I always want to be able to smell the babies. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
wonderful staff. We've got time. We've got about 20 minutes of questions. Could you identify yourself and your organisation? And, you, uh, and can you wait for a mic? One down the front right here, please. Hello, my name's Fiona Isles Riley. I'm currently writing a book. So that's basically You're what I'm doing. From where, Fiona? I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> I agree that the, the early years, years of childhood just can't be overestimated. That the educationally, socially, psychologically, emotionally, they're so important. I, I worked for a year before I went to university. I was the PA to Exeter Home Start, which was, I think it was fairly early years of Home Start at that stage. It was so successful. We took in mainly mothers that, that found they had too much spare time. They didn't know what they were doing with their lives. They wanted to help in some way. And they came in and we, we screened them police-wise and, and emotionally and checked they were quite stable and gave them a little, little bit of training. And then sent them, and they befriended mothers, with, with, usually with young kids, but kids up to about 10. And um, it was so successful, like you say, because the, the levels of success vis-a-vis -vis mm. money spent is, is very high. And it, it, was, it was just very successful. And it... That one of the main things for us was also to deal with child abuse. There was too much child abuse in the extra area. We wanted to bring that down. Mm -hmm. And it, it did really work. I think it came down for three quarters in Exeter, just by befriending the mothers, giving them an outlet for whatever they wanted to say. And like you say, like going around the supermarket and helping with the, with the kids rather than doing the shopping. Mm -hmm. That's the important bit, it's just giving emotional and practical support and we, we screened them on what they should say and things like that but basically they, they did what they felt and it just really worked mm. they got on so well we did social evenings for them and they were they really enjoyed each other's company you know they were mm. friends and it was so positive and just helping mm. those mums and the child abuse fell mm. by about three quarters which is quite impressive so yeah, it's, it's very important, the whole area. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you, much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, I know this man down the front here, please. George Jones, LSE. You've painted a picture of a very highly centralized system, highly dependent on who the ministers were, and they changed, came and went dependent on departments working together, which uh, is not something, as you've shown, uh, that Whitehall finds easy. And, of course, the looming presence of the Treasury and its attitudes and values. Uh, that would suggest to me that there's, there are limits to what the centre can do. You can set up an inspiring director an exceptional person who can energize things. But the real action, surely, must take place at the local level yeah. with the local authorities. And we've seen how the center has sabotaged the efforts of pooling budgets through total place, uh, the difficulties now of, of, of with the resource squeeze. Surely, the way ahead is to encourage local authorities to give leadership in their areas to the approach that you would like. Uh, some will adopt it with enthusiasm, others will be more laggard, and mm. there'll be difficulties in different areas. Uh, you haven't really gone into the role of local government with its democratic structures, its existing budgetary structures, mm. uh, isn't giving it to local government the answer, <laughs> rather than relying on the happy circumstances of David and Tessa getting on? <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to take several questions? Yeah, sh and yeah, answer uh, at should once we take again? one more? And one then, more. yes. Okay, so I, I, 
Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> We've got John, John over there. We will come to. We will come down. Uh, John Locke, um, parent, and uh, I spent 25 years as a school governor up the road in Newham. Um, I, I really um, enjoyed that, and I particularly agree with the last point about um, uh, parents as a child's first teacher, and the point you made earlier on about the importance of the vocabulary that a child hears. I mean, I, I've seen evidence, as obviously you have, which suggests that by, by the time child A might be of school age, they might have heard several million more words than child B. And that's not necessarily about class. Um, my wife was once complimented by a local head teacher just because she talked to our first son in public all the time. Um, and I wonder, particularly given what you described as the, the increasing work orientation of short stars, mm. how you take a what I think, I think can be described as a fact like that. that Sorry, say that again. How, how you can take what, what you can describe as a fact like that, 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 that vocal interaction with children, even if they can't reply, actually has a huge value in diminishing inequality. How um, we turn that into um, an executed policy as opposed to an observation of why there is inequality. Because mm. it seems to me that you've, you've got a really strong ba evidence base there but there's no obvious delivery mechanism for acting on it ubiquitously. Mm. And it just seems to me that one of those things I we should I think... Just couldn't hear the, I, I just couldn't hear um, the, the first bit of the question. Are you talking about the evidence base, base about the value of work or the evidence... Uh, Words. Base, yes. Talking to children. The, talking to the evidence yes. base for talking to children. Yeah, and how, and how that's acted on. Yeah. Okay, let me um, let me uh, respond to that. Well, Fiona, it's um, you know your experience was you know was obviously um, terrific, and I'm sure you contributed um, to the uh, the success. Um, George, your point. Um, I mean, Sure Start is run um, with funding by local authorities. It is now a program run by local authorities. However. I think the, uh, the question is the extent to which uh, th th there I g you, you have a kind of franchise model which basically says that in order to run Sure Start, here are the prerequisites for um, a, a program being a Sure Start program, and that those prerequisites uh, define the necessary and acceptable. Um, standard of quality. Now, of course, you're right, and uh, you know what I was talking about is what uh, got this going in the first place. But when you have a national program which goes to scale, which Sure Start now is, of course, uh, it can't be run from Whitehall, nor should it be. But that doesn't mean that uh, the the shared learning and understanding about how a program like Sure Start imparts maximum effect um, is something which isn't shared. And uh, I mean, it can be done through Ofsted, it can be done through a variety of channels. But I think this insistence um, on quality is something which is absolutely imperative. Whether you um, you know, I'm just sort of thinking aloud about this. Whether you uh, you allow Sure Start as a description of a program only if it meets necessary quality standards um, is something I think one could think about. I can remember um, three or four years ago visiting a Sure Start program, which was regarded as a flagship, um, and uh, having huge concern about um, you know the quality. Of staffing, and then going to others where you think, you know, the sense of excitement and engagement of the children is just bouncing off the walls. So, you know, of course, there's variation, but I do think um, inevitably that different areas will create a different character um, in the uh, in the service. But I think that there are um, irreplaceable, indispensable, and uh, qualities which are prerequisites for 
uh, programs or children's centres to be described as sure start centres. And they, re they rest on the, uh, the observance of the evidence um, and the, the quality of staff and um, engagement with, uh, with the children. Um, and then, uh, yes, finally, um, the uh, talking to children. I mean, that's why um, I, I think that Sure Start is an engine for uh, tackling inequality because uh, lack of social mobility, all the other things that as progressives we worry about. Okay, another round of questions. Finally, down the front here. Thanks very much. Um, Charlotte Rose, BBC, but this is entirely in a personal capacity. Um, I'm interested in what you were talking about um, in terms of the tension between a program which started off to be solely to do with nurturing and something which then became more work orientated and skills based. And that is that, would you not say that even though the intention might have changed, some of the things which were implemented in order to get parents into work, so things like giving them GCSE skills, things like confidence courses that might help them with interviews, were actually, even if inadvertently, very beneficial in terms of nurturing, because it meant they could read stories, because it meant that they had the confidence to become an advocate for their child in services their child might need when before they didn't have that confidence. And so even though the emphasis might have changed, actually there were benefits that were brought through that change yeah. in emphasis that maybe weren't existent in the original intention of the program. Thank you, Charlotte. Okay, there was a question over there. Uh, somebody earlier? No? Okay, move over there. Right, right there, please. Thanks. Um, Michael Webb from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Um, though I'm again speaking from personal capacity only. Um, and building on that last question, in fact, um, you, you talked um, towards the end about the need to be guided by policy rather than ideology. But I wonder whether it's as simple as that. And in particular, there's this very real trade-off between that you've described between the baby's need for time with the mother and the mother's desire or need for time in employment. And those things are you know, pretty distinct trade-offs and the government can calibrate them very precisely using the tax and benefit schedule and by telling how much to spend on childcare and how much to subsidise that and so on. Um, but it seems ultimately it's a decision for society or at least for politicians um, as to sort of who's going to get how much of, of those, two, those two sites and I wonder how you think about that. And there's a question just behind. Eduardo da Costa, um, Queen Mary um, student. I wanted to know um, what you think of, uh, about the idea of having an early years premium. About having a? Early years premium. Early years L premium? Yeah. Like? Uh, in what way? In, in the way that they have a pupil premium for sort of students uh -huh, in their okay. sense. Thank you. Sure. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think, um, I mean, Charlotte, you and um, Michael raise, um, raise similar questions. And of course, you're right that, uh, you know, mo I worked from the time my children were very little, but I think they got lots of nurture. And uh, these, are the, these are not, it's not uh, either or, but for, and I, I think this is what Sure Start uh, uh, identified with uh, mothers who themselves were poorly educated and who were fragile in their own sort of identity as mothers, didn't believe that they had things that they could teach uh, their, their children. Um, that that's why sort of building that sense of confidence and the importance of engaged time with your baby at a very early stage is important. It doesn't mean you can't go to work, um, uh, it, absolutely not. But um, my concern was always that um, in a way government's ne very never, good, ne never very good at looking, more, uh, l looking at more than one thing at the same time. And that uh, if you switch the focus from nurture 
to work, then nurture just simply falls away. And actually, the, um, the, uh, the challenge is to build nurture into the regime, into the culture. And uh, as I say, because I think, it, I think the evidence creates nothing short of an imperative um, to do so. Um, while at the same time, uh, making sure that while mothers are at work and their children are in the nursery, their children are well cared for in, um, an, uh, in an atmosphere and in an environment that continues to respect the importance of that and things like you know talking to children and so forth. And I mean, it's a bit, I'll go to, I was when I was 24, so it was a very long time ago. I chaired the social services committee in Camden, and was doing a, a sort of root and branch review, which got us to a conclusion all those years ago, a bit like Sure Start. But I remember going to a day nursery and being greeted by the head of the day nursery, who proudly announced that on that very day, they had received, she had received into her care um, the third generation baby of a mother whose mother and grandmother had both had their children cared for at the nursery. Now, just think about that for a minute and think how young those mothers were when they had their babies that then required uh, day nursery care. And, you know, that's, again, one of the things that, uh, you know, it w <coughs> a lot of childcare provision used to simply be about accommodating and containing children, keeping them safe in the absence of their parents. And uh, my argument is that there is an opportunity to do so much more to stim help stimulate and develop the relationship between the children and their parents, to stimulate and develop the children while at the same time giving them uh, those children the experience of understanding what it's like to have a parent who is sometimes at work. Um, Michael, the, uh, the trade-off, um, just remind me what, uh, what trade-off we're thinking about. Yes, uh, and the, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, that is the dilemma of uh, 21st century parenthood, isn't it? And uh, I suppose the answer to that is that either choice should, as far as possible, be a free choice, not one which is motivated by um, uh, the requirement to go to work too soon through you know, insecure employment, or the inability to go to work, um, and staying at home uh, in the absence of any alternative. So I think that that is, and most mothers are able to make those judgments for themselves, but I think that there is a way of helping and supporting the balance of those choices for mothers who uh, are themselves fragile. And um, an early years premium. Um, I think that uh, rec recognizing the cost of children um, should be uh, a calculation which is made in uh, support to families, uh, particularly through the, uh, the tax system. And so where, whereas I would hope, and I've said this before, that uh, the general system of tax credits can in time um, be replaced by more employers paying the living wage and obviating the need for state subsidy for low wages. Um, what remains, and particularly acutely in London, is the very high cost of uh, looking after your children well. So I think you may be onto something. Right, we're coming very much to the end, so, so just a few very, very, very quick questions. One right here, please. Hi, Sarah. I'm a student here at Queen Mary. You Hi. talked about um, childcare providers uh, having a more integral role into the nurturing of children because there's this need for parents to go back to work. 
mother works in a preschool and at one point me I was on a similar hourly wage to her working in a clothes shop than she was looking after children and do you think there needs to be a change in the monetary value we put on these people who are looking after our children? Um, well, I, uh, y y um, sort of yes and no. Um, yes, where uh, you know nursery staff are look at, you know are looking after children in a professional capacity. One of the um, developments that um, I uh, it, it, this is this is slightly the home start um, part of of Sure Start is um, I hope th the development of this idea of community mothers. So mothers, which is w w which I've always thought, but I saw um, at the nursery I went to last week. And uh, these are mothers who support each other, where more experienced mothers will um, provide support, help, um, you know, a shoulder to cry on, a source of advice uh, to new mothers. And uh, you know that's. Uh, I, th I think there are ways of that. You know, g I, I, in setting up um, that sort of network of support, um, I would do what <coughs> um, the mothers that I was talking to last week have done, which is look at you know NVQ qualifications in return for your availability um, to other mothers in your community. Um, but certainly, um, I mean the kind of co the kind of comparison that you uh, that you give. Uh, I think it sort of presupposes that childcare has been a notoriously undertrained um, profession, and I think my argument would be that if you're going to build this extra capacity, really realise the potential of this engagement between. Um, the staff in nurseries and very tiny children, then um, it's almost certain that staff need to be uh, more highly trained. Thank you. At the back over there, please. Thank you. Alan Evans. I'm a civil servant in the Scotland office, but um, at the time of 97 election, I was principal of private secretary to David Blunkett, so I well remember those heady days you described and the success of Shore Start policy. I wonder if I could ask you though to comment on an area that was less successful, namely welfare reform. Why was the new Labour government so unsuccessful on the welfare reform agenda? And indeed, within two years, Tony Blair had sacked both his Secretary of State for Social S Services, Harriet Harman, and his Minister for Welfare Reform, Frank Field. Um. <laughs> Hello, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't see you sitting at the back there. Um, I th well, first of all, on, on welfare reform, uh, I think there was too much rush to do things quickly. And uh, you had a clash between two key ministers uh, that meant that no policy was ever going to be agreed. So, I mean, that was, you know, they're both highly talented people, but... Um, the expectations that were attached to their relationship, I think, were, were just, you know, unsus unsustainable. But on um, welfare reform, I, d I don't think that we were uh, completely hopeless on welfare reform. Uh, why did we fail so dramatically? Well, I mean, completely hopeless is a sort of fair mm. conclusion to draw from that. And I don't mm. think that is the case, actually. Um, but I think that... Both we and uh, th this government um, have failed, we failed to recognize how long a period change needs to be, uh, to, to, to be undertaken over. So um, if you do things very quickly for kind of headline effect, uh, A, you don't save much money, you don't, uh, you don't change behavior very much, and you cause a lot of pain. And actually, the, uh, the case for uh, the constant uh, reform of the welfare state is unarguable, as patterns of employment change, uh, family patterns change, the economy moves in and out of growth. 
um, you know, the welfare state, you know, marches alongside this, but it has to adapt and change to these, uh, the, these circumstances. So <coughs> I think that, again, um, the way in which you create the platform for sustained reform of the welfare state is through uh, not a tribal, but a sort of, you know, if you like, an alliance of shared values um, that mean that change that's decided now um, is change that can be given effect over the next eight uh, to ten years. And then people believe it. Um, but while you know, it's simply tactical, um, you know, it gives politics a bad name, it confuses the public, and uh, you get this horrible uh, situation where you know, people are who are on benefits, the majority of whom want to work and wish they weren't on benefits, are treated like pariahs. Thank you. And the last question to the actual mic holder himself. Thank you, John. Um, I think you partially answered my question earlier, so I'll have to phrase my uh, question carefully. You talked about the disruption to a lot of policy because of the electoral cycle. Do you think that by having allocated uh, financial responsibility and implementation to local government that um, because of the immediacy of Sure Start centres to the constituents for local government, this has insulated Sure Start from some of the disruption of uh, electoral handover? And do you have any other suggestions for how it could be further insulated from this disruption? Yeah. No, it's a, it's a very interesting question. I mean, the answer is evidently not because of the number of, you know, more than 350, I think it is now, um, Sure Start uh, centres that have been closed. Now, it's not clear, and I intend to do some work on this, to what extent uh, the services have been uh, relocated um, or translated into um, another form uh, and to what ex extent, you know, the... Um, the uh, the locks you know the padlocks are on the doors of the center and there is nothing left um, change is not of itself bad um, but certainly no there's no evidence that sure start uh, centers have been insulated from the cuts on local authorities and we know that uh, next year is going to be the hardest because um, uh, so much of the um, the cut was backloaded. Well, that brings to an end Mylan Group 104. Uh, the 105th Mylan Group will be with Andrew Adonis and Michael Heseltine next week on Two Futures for London. Um, uh, can I say a huge thank you to our sponsors, HP and the City of London Corporation, without which these things simply would not happen. So please, would you first of all join me for a drink, and second of all, join me in thanking Dame Tessa for a marvellously informative lecture. Thank you. Thank you.